This is Conrad Nagel inviting you to stay tuned for the next half hour for one of radio's outstanding dramatic productions on Proudly We Hail. Proudly We Hail. Now, another Proudly We Hail, one of radio's outstanding dramatic half-hours, transcribed coast to coast in cooperation with this station and presented by your Army and your Air Force. From Radio City, New York, here is your host and star on Proudly We Hail, the distinguished star of the theater, screen, radio, and television, Conrad Nagel. Thank you, Kenneth Banghart. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Proudly We Hail. Conrad, what's the title of our play? Kenneth's titled Lady on the Run. And we meet Joan Flagg, a very frightened young lady in very frightening circumstances. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment after this brief but very important message. Here's a special message. The United States Army needs young men, men with ambition who want to continue their education. If you can qualify, the Army will send you to one of its many fine technical schools. The Army trains its men in such interesting, exciting fields as radio, radar electronics, mechanics, meteorology, and many, many others. You'll not only get the finest training in the world, but you'll have the special pride that goes with wearing a United States Army uniform. Today, there are plenty of chances for a man to get ahead, for our Army is growing fast, and ambitious young men can grow with it. But... Why not learn for yourself about what the Army has to offer? Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Have a talk with a recruiting sergeant and learn all the facts. And now with your star, Conrad Nagel, in the role of Norman Webb, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Lady on the Run. You know, it's funny how a thing gets started. You try and think of all the ways it might happen, and usually what does happen is quite different from anything you'd imagined. The world of illusion and the world of reality divided by the science of logic. Sometimes all three get so wound up in each other that the result affects your whole life. It began when I walked into the Continental Trailways bus terminal on a warm evening in October. I was surprised at the number of people who were going places. You would have thought it was midsummer. Crowd was a good thing for me, though. Made it so much simpler to lose my identity. Continental's ticket agents had things down pat. The line I stood in moved rapidly, and almost before I knew it, the only thing in the way of me buying my fare was a lovely-looking, dark-haired girl who didn't seem to be quite sure where she wanted to go. Uh, where to, miss? Uh your buses go to New Mexico? Why, yes, ma'am. All over the southwest. Uh, where did you want to go in New Mexico? Uh, Santa... Uh, Santa Fe? N no. No, Albuquerque. That's it. Albuquerque. And please hurry. Oh, bus doesn't leave for another 15 minutes, miss. Uh, round trip or one way? One way. Here, is this enough? Oh, it's not that much. It's only one... Please hurry. Yes, ma'am. Now, you go through that gate to your bus. Now, here's your ticket. Now, thank you. Uh, miss, miss, your change. Oh, oh, yeah, yes. Thank you, Vanny. Well little lady seemed confused. Yes, sir. Uh, where to? One way. To Albuquerque. I was the last one to climb aboard. It was best to be sure. Well, the bus was big and modern, air-conditioned, with thick, comfortable seats. I picked one a little more than halfway back. Uh, excuse me, mind if I sit here? Uh, oh, no, no, I guess not. If you'd rather be alone, I can find a seat further back. Well, no, that's all right. I don't mind. Oh, thanks. Ah, well, good to sit down. Dave, you want to read? There's a light there above your head. I know. I don't want to read, thank you. More fun to watch the lights, eh? More fun to watch the city fade away. You know, I always get a kick out of leaving someplace, any place. Good to be on the move. 
Uh, like a cigarette? Not right now, thanks. Uh, are you going far? Yeah, yeah, a long way. Tucson, how about you? I, I'm going to Phoenix. Well, what do you know? You live there? No, just a visit, to, to see my brother-in-law. <laughs> it's the first time I ever heard that one. What do you mean? What's so funny about that? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. You know, usually people go to see their fathers, their mothers, their sisters, their grandmothers, or somebody like that. Brother-in-law just struck me funny. Why not your sister? My sister's dead. My brother-in-law's all I've got left to go to. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, it's I... not your fault. Look, since we're going to be traveling a long way together, why don't we introduce ourselves? I'm Norman Webb. My name is Joan. Joan Flagg. How do you do? Do I call you Joan or Miss Flagg? <laughs> I must say, you work fast. Oh, just I hate formality. I hate to waste time. Look, we're two people traveling a long way on a bus. We might just as well get to know one another. Eh? The sooner the better. Suppose we sat here like a couple of wooden Indians and never said boo to one another. What a waste. So you're Joan, I'm Norman. And isn't it a wonderful world? Sometimes it can be a very horrible world. Nothing but a black nightmare. It was about three o'clock in the morning when we stopped. The city we pulled into wore the silence of deep night, the building standing dark and empty behind pale, sleepless street lights. A stray cat scurrying into an alleyway, a breeze hurting pages of newspaper along the gutter. Well, some of our fellow passengers followed the driver into the terminal, eager for that vital cup of coffee, but most of us stayed put. I didn't think my dark-haired companion was asleep. But her suddenly jerking upright with a short gasp of fear certainly proved it. Oh, no. Well, what's the matter? That, that car, those men. A long black car had pulled up on the other side of the street and two men had gotten out. They were both big. Both wore top coats and felt hats. They came across the street toward the bus. It's them. It's them. Now, take it easy, Joan. Take it easy. You know these men? I, I've got to get out of here. Please let me get by. Say, wait a minute. You don't think I'd let them hurt you? Oh, fool, get out of my way. Let go of easy, me. Easy, easy. Does it? You wait till they're on the bus. Look, they're not coming in here. They're going in there. Probably get a cup of coffee. Now's my chance. No, no. One of them standing outside. Look, who are they? Will you please stop asking stupid questions and let me get off this bus? If you don't, I'll call for help. No, that'll attract attention. Oh, please, why won't you let me go? Whatever it is you're afraid of, you're much safer with me. That's what you think. Listen. Oh, here they come. Pull that blanket up around your face. No, 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 higher, What higher. are you doing? Putting my arm around you. All right, get your head down on my chest. Now, just relax and let your Uncle Norman handle this. What's the matter? Are you looking for something? As a matter of fact, I am. Well, whatever it is, you won't find it here. Who's that? My wife, if it's any of your blasted business. Oh, calm down, buddy. You're talking to the law. The law? Well, what do you want with us? We haven't done anything. Now, don't panic, Mac. Seen anything of a girl looks like this? Turn that light on there. You can see better. No, no, need to. I can see all right. Oh. No, no, I haven't. Pretty, ain't she? So what? Not a year enough fruitcake, that's all. Dangerous. All right, go on back to sleep. Sorry I bothered you. I want to thank you. Forget it. I suppose... Try to you... get some sleep. I suppose you believed him. The picture he showed me was of a girl with blonde hair. Your hair's dark. You knew it was me. I don't know anything. You you think he really was a policeman, don't you? Well, that's what he said. Well, well, why didn't you hand me over? You heard what he said. Not here in the fruitcake. <laughs> Who isn't? <laughs> now, calm down, Joan. Calm down. You're all right. Look, we can talk about this in the morning after we both had some sleep. <laughs> How can I sleep? Simple. Just put your head on my shoulder. There. They won't be looking for you on this bus anymore. You don't know them. You didn't fool him for a minute. If I hadn't fooled him, you wouldn't be here now. Well, they wouldn't take me off the bus. They're too smart for that. They'll wait. They'll wait till no one's around. A funny way for the law to do business. That's just it. They were no more policemen than I am. Well, who were they then? Well? I can't tell you. You... You'd think I was crazy, too. Sometimes I think I am. 
people tell you a thing long enough, maybe it's so. All the next day, we pounded westward. The country had that wide open look, and the miles fell away with ease. My companion had little to say, and we'd almost assumed that wooden Indian method of travel of which I'd spoken. You know, it was quite a situation. A lovely girl who dyed her hair black. A lovely girl who was supposed to be out of her mind, but to me only seemed nervous and frightened. A lovely girl on the run who said she was going to Phoenix, but was really headed for Albuquerque. And two men from whom she was fleeing who said they were police. Science of logic was getting all beaten up in my mind. At dusk, we made one of those ten-minute wayside halts in a dusty little town an hour out of Amarillo. Ten minutes, folks. Ten minutes. Plenty of time to eat when we get to Amarillo. Yeah. Want to stretch a bit? All right. Might be a good idea. Nothing like a good stretch after a long, quiet day. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. That's better. Now, you're showing signs of improvement. <laughs> no, no. There are no black cars out there. Hey, watch your step. Oh, yes. Well, once around the block will be about all we have time for. You know, you haven't told me what you do. Hey, that's right, I haven't. In fact, I haven't told you much at all about myself. I'm a very interesting fella. <laughs> You've got about ten years to spare. I'll tell you all about me. <laughs> You're so modest. <laughs> I'm the soul of modesty. If I wasn't modest, it'd take 25. I'm really very grateful to you. <laughs> Want to um, tell me anything about it? You wouldn't believe me. Well, why not? Because no one has. Harry's my last chance. Oh, the brother-in-law. Yes. You say our friends last night weren't the police. Well, well they uh, weren't the police. I've been to the police. They didn't believe me either. Go on. Well, well those, those two men, they, they work for Everett Dunlop. He, well, he's yes, all I've heard of him. Uh, what's he got to do with you? Well, he's my guardian. Until next month, then I'll be 25. You see, my father and mother were killed a little over a year ago in an automobile accident. My sister was with them, too. Dad was quite wealthy, and everything was left to me. But not until I'm 25. Everett Dunlop was left in charge of the estate. You think Dunlop is after your money? Well, he's rich enough. Well, at least he seems to be. Well, I, I think he's been trying to drive me insane. Drive you insane? But what would... Now, wait a minute. Let me finish. After the accident, I guess I did go after, out of my head for a while... We were very close, my family, and the shock, and, well, well, it was too much for me to take. I, I cracked up. When I got out of the hospital, Everett Dunlop couldn't do enough to help. He insisted I come live with him and his sister. They, they have a big, ugly place. Yes, I yes, know I know. I, I've seen it. Well, it depressed me. I didn't like it there. They insisted I stay until I was well. Nothing seemed to matter very much then, and I let them have their way. Well, about three months ago, it, I'd had all I could take told him I wanted to get a job, and they were very understanding about it. Everett said he thought he could help. Well, and then? Well, and then, that night, the light had burned out in the hall, and when I came out of my room to go down to dinner, I fell down the stairs. My ankle was broken, and then I hit my head. A concussion, the doctor said. Only I didn't slip. I was tripped. Someone had tied a piece of wire or string across the top strap. I remember it hitting my ankle. Well, that was the beginning. How do you mean? Little things, things you couldn't prove. Waking up in the middle of the night and, and knowing, knowing that there was someone else in the room, calling for help, and when they came, no one there. Or putting a book down on a table and leaving the room and coming back and finding it gone. Then when I asked, being told I'd left the book on the terrace. Oh, I, I can't tell you all the things. And, well, and then they'd look at me and pretend to be concerned. I wasn't well. I needed rest. Poor Joan finally suggesting it might be a good idea for a doctor friend of theirs had a talk with me. Well, not that it was serious, but they wanted the help. And then when I could get out, those two men following me, wherever I went, and, and when I spoke about it, a look of horror. There were no two men. I must be mistaken. I mustn't think such things. I must only think about getting well. I was desperate. There was, there was nobody I could turn to. Our home had been in Kansas City. Finally, I went to the police. What did they say? Oh, they were very polite. They listened. Well, after all, there was no proof, nothing. It was all against me. Everett Dunlop, an important figure, wealthy, a staunch pillar of society, and the poor girl. Well, uh, suppose you were declared insane. If I could be declared insane, he could go on administering the estate till kingdom come. Oh. Worth how much? Something over two million dollars altogether. 
How come your father didn't leave it to you outright? I guess he thought that by the time I was 25, <laughs> I'd be sane enough to handle that much. <laughs> sane enough. <laughs> now, look, Miss Crane, you... He you... said, Crane. How did you know my name was Crane? I told you... Your name is Crane, and you're not going to Phoenix. You're going to Albuquerque. You are... No. No, you're one of them, too. Let go of me. Wait. Wait. Joan! Joan, that's no good. You can't get away, you little idiot! Conrad Nagel, starring in the role of Norman Webb in the proudly we hail production Lady on the Run, will return in just a moment for the second act. I have an important message for intelligent young men. A new United States Army regulation now permits you to apply for OCS, Officer Candidate School, before you enlist. That's right. If you're at least 19 years old and can meet the physical and mental standards for Army officers, Regardless of whether you're a high school graduate, you can go to your recruiting station and volunteer as an officer candidate. You'll take basic training, attend leadership school, and then go to the next available class at OCS. You'll be promoted to corporal when you go to OCS, and upon graduation, become a second lieutenant in the United States Army with good pay and allowances for food and quarters. Young American women have the same opportunity to become officers in the Women's Army Corps, but you'd better act now, for no one knows how long it will be before our growing army has all the officers it needs. Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and get all the facts today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now with your star Conrad Nagel in the role of Norman Webb, we present the second act of Lady on the Run. <laughs> She could run, I'll say that for her. Of course, fear can make a sprinter out of anyone. But it wasn't until we'd left most of the town and some mighty startled-looking pedestrians behind that I finally caught up to her. Let go of me. Let me go. Hey, wait a minute. Take it easy, will you? No! Go on. Yell your lungs out if it'll make you feel any better. Let me alone. You... Sit down there. You won't take me back. Lord, what a woman. You won't take me back. You can't. You can't make me go. Your guardian, Mr. Dunlop, won't be very happy if I don't. I should have known you were one of them. You knew all about him. Why couldn't I... Look. Look, there goes our bus. I'll wait here until another one comes. No, you've run far enough, Joni. It's time you walked a little. With me to slow you down. <laughs> I was figuring on hiring a car to drive us over to Amarillo where we'd get a plane for home, but it wasn't necessary. As we approached the town's only hotel, I saw standing in front of it the familiar black car with the out-of-state license plates. Well, looks like we got a ride. Wonder what brought them here. As if you didn't know. Yeah, but the bus is gone. Oh, they're smart, just like you. They'd probably find out we weren't on it. There's our old pal. Hey, how about a lift? Well, as I live and breathe. <laughs> how about a lift to Amarillo? Got to catch a plane. Well, ain't you a character? Glam in, Miss Crane. My friend here and I have got a little talk to have. Yeah, let's do that. Wait till I get George. Yeah, get George by all means. Time we stop this fooling around. You can say that again. Hey, George, look who's here. Miss Crane, please don't ever take a powder like that again. You don't know how worried Mr. Dunlop is. Easy, easy does it, Bob. The girl's all tired out. Yeah, so are we. Driving halfway across the country. We were just going to visit her brother-in-law. Oh, do tell. And to think... Oh, be still. She means shut up. <laughs> you know, dames are all nuts, but this one takes the cake. Hmm. Looks like we're coming into Amarillo. What are you going to do with the car? Well, George here has been appointed to drive it home. I'll take the plane with you. We don't want any more mix-ups. The little lady needs taken care of. Hey, 
Better eat some of that, Joan. It's good. I'm not hungry. <laughs> you should have an appetite like book over there. Yeah, I eat like a horse. I just, just like to be left alone. I'm, I'm tired. I want to sleep. I'll have the stewardess bring you a pillow. Never mind. We'll be landing soon, Miss Crane. Then you'll get plenty of rest. Mr. Dunlop, he'll see that nobody disturbs you. He's quite a guy. Loves her like a daughter. Yeah, she is. He's a fine man, all right. Perfect gentleman. He's got your best interests at heart, Miss Crane. We all have. <laughs> I think that sums up the whole thing perfectly. Well, we made the drive from the airport to Everett Dunlop's big, cold-looking estate in silence. It was quite some way out of the city, in one of those sections where all the homes were big. Our charge sat hunched down in the corner, a weary and resigned look on her lovely, haunted face. Well, it was almost over. Yeah, pay the man, Book. Yeah, after you, Miss Crane. I hope Mr. Dunlop hasn't gone to bed yet. Don't worry about him. He never goes to bed. I just lean on that bill. Yeah, I'm leaning. Ah, cozy little spot. Yeah, ain't it a pip? Yes, what is... Joan. Joan. You've come back. Boke, you've We found... got him, Mr. Dunlop. Well, come in. Come in. Oh? Who is this? Lieutenant Webb, police department. Lieutenant Webb, but... Uh, why but... don't we come in, like you said? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Joe, why did you do it? Why did you run off? Oliva's been worried sick. I, I, I've been frantic. Why? Uh, where can we talk, Mr. Dunlop? Talk? I don't think I understand. Why don't we talk right here? We'll go into the den. After you, Joan. Where did you find the folk? Oh, Lieutenant here, he found him. Been with us since she got on the bus. We ran into him outside of Amarillo. Sit down, won't you? I'll fix a drink. Uh, never mind, this won't take long. Oh? Uh, Miss Crane here paid us a call about ten days ago, Mr. Dunlop. I wasn't there, but she told my boss her troubles... The story she told didn't hold much water. Well, you must understand that she's been a very sick girl. There's no reason to think... You see, uh, I told the... you, I told you. Suppose you let me finish. A few days later, you paid us a call. That's right, I came you there You were to... worried about her, so I know all about that, too. Your story held water. <laughs> see, I'm the kind of a cop that never takes anything for granted, Mr. Dunlop. I decided to do a little routine checking... After all, if the girl was on the verge of cracking up, as you so reluctantly pointed out, it might not be a bad idea for me to keep an eye on her, just to see that she didn't do anything to endanger herself or, uh, well, anyone else. But, Lieutenant Webb, if yes, you remember, I, I said she... I know what you said. First thing I found out was that Boke here and his sidekick were keeping an eye on her, too. Well, now, since Boke and George both have records that would fill a book... I began to wonder who they were working for. It wasn't hard to find out. Oh, come now, aren't you exaggerating? There's nothing wrong with giving a couple of men a chance to live honest lives? No, no, nothing at all. Admirable, in fact. See, I didn't stop there. I began checking up on you. You began checking up on... What? What do you mean? I what... mean you're just about broke, Mr. Dunlop. Oh, you've hidden it well, but it all came out. Well, of course, there's nothing wrong with that either. But when Miss Crane decided to take a bus ride, I decided to go along with her. I didn't tell her who I was until I was convinced she was a perfectly sane young lady, being scared out of her wits. You didn't want her dead, or I'm sure she would have been dead long ago. If she died, you'd lose that two million bucks. But if you could drive her into an insane asylum, you'd be sitting pretty. Why, 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 why of all the utter rot, I... Be I've... quiet. There's no proof, I'll grant you that. Only your word against hers. But you see, I'm buying Just hers. a moment. Who's your superior? Captain Gillian. I called him from Amarillo. He wants to see you in his office at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And as for you, Boke, I could have you and George run in for impersonating police officers. So you show up when Mr. Dunlop does. And he said he wanted help. I've had enough of this. I hope it's just the beginning, Mr. Dunlop. Joan, tell them you made it all up. You tell them, Everett. They always believe you. There's just one other thing. Miss Crane here comes into her estate in another month. Until that time, she'll be under our protection. I should say, my protection. 
I'll be her guardian as long as she thinks she needs me. You can't bluff me. I'll fight you. This girl's mentally incompetent. Now, I've got doctor's report. Well, uh, suppose you say them for the judge, and when you hand over what you've been keeping for, it had better all be there. Or you know where you'll be. Well, I guess that's it. Got anything to say, Joni? Yes, let's get out of here. I'll call a cab. No, I've got a car. This will break Oliva's heart. It probably will, but not the way you mean. Uh, Eight o'clock tomorrow, Dunlop. Captain Gillian doesn't like to be kept waiting. You were wonderful. Oh, sure. I'm always wonderful. It's a wonderful world, too. No more horrible nightmares? Not a one. Good. You know, I could stand a wife with two million bucks, but I could never stand one with nightmares. Our star, Conrad Nagel, will return with a word about next week's show in just a moment. Did you ever stop to wonder why your United States Army has such a long tradition of victory? Well, the secret is a very simple one. It's training that pays off. Old soldiers will tell you that it's good training plus the best leadership that spells victory. Your United States Army has always emphasized both. The United States Army is rapidly expanding now. Young men and young women with the will to learn can get ahead fast. So take advantage of the opportunities for advancement that can be yours by enlisting now. Visit the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Station in your neighborhood and learn all the facts. Enlist in the United States Army today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. Proudly We Hail stars Conrad Nagel. Supporting Mr. Nagel as Joan Flagg was Helen Christen. Lady on the Run was written by DeWitt Cop. The music was composed and conducted by John Guarnieri. This program was produced under the supervision of Charles and Rogers Productions and was directed by Charles Wilkes. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking, and here again is your host and star, Conrad Nagel. Well, friends, we hope you'll join us again next week over this same station for Proudly We Hail. Travel with us to the Old West and follow a United States Cavalry Patrol in the Western Badlands in a thrilling story titled Warpath. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>